Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We're hoping that you're having a wonderful today, wonderful day today, and you're ready to study through the Gospel of John. That's where we'll be picking up here in just a moment, chapter 6, there in verse number 16. Verse 16. Stay like that. Um, before we bring everyone in, let me remind you how you can participate in today's study. If you are viewing this on, boy, I'm hitting all the wrong buttons today. All the wrong buttons, man. Anyway, <laughs> see, here's my buttons and I'm hitting the wrong ones today. So anyway, if you've joined us on our Facebook page, then we'd love to hear from you. Drop a comment to this live video. Let us know what you have to think. If you have any questions or comments, Share them with us there. If you are on our YouTube channel, you can use the chat area there. And by the way, both our Facebook and our YouTube is Truth Factor Live. We do have a Twitter or X account. We don't use it very much, much, but you can send us a direct message that way as well. You can send any questions to questions at Truth Factor Live, or as you see on the screen there, email us individually. And we'll be more than happy to um, get back with you as soon as we can or bring it into our next study. Let's bring everyone into the study today. Gentlemen, it's good to see everyone today. Looks like we are missing Brendan, and Brian is still lost in Peru somewhere, isn't he? Hey, looks like we are missing Brendan, and... Yep, Sorry, still okay. lost in Peru. <laughs> it's all right. Um, he'll be coming back at some point, and I'm sure he'll have some interesting um, accounts and tales to tell. There was one that he sent us individually that I... Y'all want to wait till he gets back to kind of share his account where you can talk about it personally. I think it was really, yeah. really and, heart touching, he, really interesting. Right. Yeah. And he will be back next week. Like I said, he, he's, he's okay. actually scheduled to be with us Sunday. So, so he, mm. he's, he's supposed to spend the night with me or at our house on Saturday night, he and Wendy. So, so that'll just add one more tell to his tell of his adventures staying with Tom. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So, Oh, who do we have with us today? Looks like we have Caleb Davis has chimed in. Gregor Hinckley's with us as well. Jared Dart. We have Chris Kramer, David Clark, Jerry Wilcox, um, Eileen Haynes, and others. And by the way, if you haven't, if this is your first time joining us for a study, take just a moment and say, hey, I'm Bob from Minnesota, or I think I used that joke last time. Anyway, I'm Paul from Nebraska. How about that? We'll go that route. And um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. And if you have any thoughts or comments, please do share them with us. Gentlemen, we left off having studied up through verse number 15 of John chapter 6. I have down that we're supposed to start there in verse 16. So for reading purposes, though, let's step back and grab verse 15. Bob, would you mind reading for us verses 15 down through verse 21? John yeah. 6. 15 through 21. Yeah, or 15. Let's back up one. Just begin there. Which, which teen? 15. 15. Yeah, through 21. Okay. And I'm reading from the New King James translation. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose, because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Bob. We also saw that Terry Benton has joined us for our study today. It's good to have you with us as well, Mr. Terry. Good to have you with us. So looking at the text here, and we did discuss chapter 15, or verse 15 last week. It kind of falls there, um, you know, ending the previous section. But notice here... He departed again to the mountain by himself. Bob, this seems to be something Jesus does quite frequently. The idea of getting away by himself. You know, that impresses me so much that uh, Jesus felt the need to just be 
uh, with God the Father and to be free from the distractions uh, of life and free from the, uh, not so much distractions from his ministry, but free from the crowds that gathered uh, to hear him preach or to bring somebody to be healed. Uh, he had a tremendous weight upon his shoulders as even as a member of the Godhead. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think he, there were times he just needed to be uh, communing with God, the Father, uh, such as in the, uh, the wilderness temptation. He was out there seeing to his spiritual nourishment rather than his physical nourishment, which Satan used or the tempter used to try to get him to turn stones into bread to, to eat. But he said, well, no, I've got something more important to, uh, to sustain me. And that's the word of God. He implied that in Matthew 4, 4, uh, not in man, not a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that's, and that's to me why he is, alone so much he's, he's never alone completely uh he's always got the father with him and the holy spirit is always with him jesus said that on one occasion uh on more than one occasion one or the other and so uh yeah he just he just needed to get away from the uh from the people uh because he as even though they needed him he needed he needed to be with with the father more than he needed to be with them i think well i th i think that's a good point um yeah. and he probably had very little alone time at this stage in in his life like you already talked about with the masses coming his disciples coming after him people asking questions and that's not a bad thing cuz this was his purpose here but yeah i now, do you think that would be helpful to us? And, and I say that to share Caleb's comment. Caleb says, we all need time to reconnect with God. And he says, if Jesus did it, then we should do it as well. Any thoughts or comments about that? I have long thought that to be true. If we, if Jesus, the son of God needed to pray, needed a long time to pray, then, then how much more do we? Yeah. And it's not simply, well, I want some alone time because you hear people say that. And I can completely understand that. You know, after being married 37 years, you need some alone time. Um, I don't think she's watching today, so I'm, I'm safe with that. It's not on recording or anything. But 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 this is the same thing as simply wanting alone time. This goes back to what you were saying, Bob, or what Caleb said. It's the intentional setting away time so that we can commune, pray to um even meditate upon the word of god right yeah yeah you know uh uh we need we need time where we can remove as many distractions as possible yeah focused with god i think that's the point and uh, and the other text i would appeal to with this is in matthew 6 when okay. when jesus is teaching about prayer about, about what about verse 6 or 7 i think it is you know and, and he makes the point there uh, you know, you go to your closet, uh, as uh, I think the King James reads, it, uh, verse six, or verse five and six. Yeah. When you pray, you shall yeah. not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. I sure do. I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You, you, you know, when you're by yourself with God, there's there's no pretension going on. I, I, I mean, I mean, if you know who God is, you know that there's no sense in trying to lie to him. <laughs> you know, there's no sense in trying to hide anything because God knows everything. And so for us, I think and I always use the illustration, if Jesus, the very son of God, needed this private time if jesus the very son of god needed to pray as much as he did what does that say about the rest of us there's a lot we can learn from that that's an uh, that's a good point yeah excellent point all right any other thoughts or comments 
So let's go a little further here with this. Let me get back to our text. There we go. So, of course, as we read through here, we find the disciples was evening. They went down to the sea. They went, got into boats and went over the sea towards the city of Capernaum. And um, Jesus was not with them. Darkness came. And as the story unfolds here, this account, the sea arose because of a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, as, as it's translated for us here, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. He's already showed several times his power, his might, even, even over nature. But this right here, to me, is mind-blowing. If we look at it from a very physical way, there are so many things, so many laws that are broken when he does this, when he walks out there on the water. But this just simply goes to show that he was not bound or limited by the physical limitations um, that we are bound by. Um, but any thoughts about the latter part of verse 19, their reaction when they saw his figure out there on the water? Yeah, I just want to call attention to the fact you're not yep. talking about uh, the laws of Moses, <laughs> but the physical laws, laws. Of yes, physics. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, laws of physics. The, for the listener, I just wanted to clarify that, to make sure yeah. they understand. <laughs> not, not the most yeah, yeah. Thou shalt not walk on water on the Sabbath day or nothing like that. Right. <laughs> this probably is the first of the two infants, uh, two instances of jesus walking on the water uh there was another instance where peter also walks on the water mm -hmm. uh momentarily yep because of his great faith but then he takes his eyes off of jesus and and that tells us also the mm -hmm. so keeping our eyes on jesus yep. our spiritual eyes if not our our physical eyes and so, yeah, they were they were kind of blown away here, and you, you understand why they're afraid. Here comes somebody seeming to walk on water, and I think Tom has made this point in the past. They never anticipate a miracle, <laughs> and so it doesn't yeah. occur to them that this is Jesus. They think it's a a, a ghost or something, uh, or some kind of a a purely spiritual being without. Uh, any uh, physical body, I forget what word is used. It may be phantasm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mark uses the word ghost. Okay. And so. And it is, yeah, yeah, phantasma. So, yeah, I'd be afraid too. Yeah. <laughs> if I did not already know what, if I wasn't one of Jesus, if I was one of Jesus' disciples in the first century and I didn't already know that he could do this. Yeah, I would be afraid. And they don't seem to have that fear in the other instance uh, where Peter says, if it, if it be you, bid, yeah. bid me that I'll come to you. And so he has confidence that if Jesus bids it, then he will be able also to walk on the water, which he does. Yeah, that's a good point. It's, it's interesting that they, in verse 19, it says they saw Jesus walking on the water but there seems to be an implication there that they didn't know it was jesus because yeah. uh, he says it is i uh he once he identifies himself they don't seem to be quite as as troubled and so uh, just just a thought about that they they saw someone walking on the water it happened to be jesus but they didn't necessarily recognize that it was him uh but he says to them it is i do not be afraid and then they willingly received him into the boat i don't know what they would have done if he had not identified himself uh but but in this case uh he does and, yeah. and they they welcome him in well if, if we kind of think about what this would have looked looked like it's nighttime if there was enough moonlight out to have illuminated him you have the problem with the wind blowing and possibly the waves on the sea so it makes you wonder how far out were they able to see him? Probably not very far. And it was whatever, however it appeared to them, it was enough to scare them until they realized, like you said, who they were, who he was. But we have a couple of comments I want to go ahead and bring in real quick. Some of them touch on our discussion of uh, going to be alone to pray. 
and then some will will bring back around to the power of Jesus here over nature. So the first one we have being brought in is from David Clark. He says, we all need to pray every day and also study the word. Yes, a secret, quiet pray place. And that, that's a good point. A time to pray as in talking to our Heavenly Father and a time to study listening to him. And then Terry, he says, when the woman touched him, he felt power leaving him. Think back to that miracle. Perhaps he feels power leaving him when he is constantly with needy people. He must feel a renewal by being um, alone with the Father. You know, Terry, I think that's a very interesting point. We know Jesus living in our physical body. He suffered as we do, whether it's pain, hunger, bleeding, what have you. And so there may have been that type of, with everything going on, needing to step away. I don't want to say recharge, but to, yeah, to, to rest um, and to have that time alone. It's a very good point. And then David, he says, Jesus had unlimited power and still does. And that the biggest display of that is the power over sin and death. And then Caleb says, if the Pharisees could have used that against Jesus, they would have. Talking about, you know, thou shalt not walk on the Sabbath day, walk on water on the Sabbath day, all in jest there. And Caleb's jesting as well with us. Terry then says, Moses and Joshua were given power to part the waters. And Jesus demonstrates that he is the one with power over the waters. That's a good point. That's a very, very good point. Um, the other two, their, what they did, Moses and Joshua, showed that God was with them when Jesus did it. It showed that he was God. He, he had the power and the authority there. Um, it's a good point. Good point. Any, any thoughts about those comments, guys? You know, if I, I had the privilege of going to Israel back in 2000, and the Sea of Galilee is just fascinating as they explain things to us. Uh, if there was no wind, it was just as smooth as glass. And uh, travel across it was so easy. But when there was uh, a storm at, at sea, uh, such as here, that the, a great wind was blowing, that would greatly reduce the, your visibility. And so I could understand that if they would see Jesus and not recognizing him and not being able to think of anybody else who could do that, they, they jump to the conclusion that it's a phantasm, uh, that it's a ghost where, you know, uh, it, it doesn't look like Jesus to me. Uh, but, uh, of course it, it was. And, uh, but at any rate, uh, they 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 are afraid because of the storm then they are their fear is increased because of someone something they see uh walking on the on the sea and he's getting closer and closer and so their fear uh, continues to increase and uh so that's when he says like tom did uh, like tom indicated it is i do not be afraid and they would certainly recognize his voice uh, as well as his uh, as well as his face. And then they received him into the boat. And the boat was at, at the land where they were going and they were going from the eastern to the western uh, bank of the uh, Sea of Galilee. And they had already rode, uh, what does it say, uh, rode, R-O-W-E-D, for some three or four miles. So they haven't yet cross, finished crossing the sea, probably at its widest point here. But immediately, as soon as Jesus got in the boat, they are on the shore. And so what had been a long and arduous battle with the wind became an easy ride now that Jesus is, is with them. Okay. Would you think that may be anything similar to when Philip was called away and found at what Azotus? Or do you think it's just uh, a reference to how quickly they were able to sail the rest of the distance? I think, I think that's it. Uh, maybe even they had a head, uh, a tailwind at this point, uh, as opposed to a headwind, uh, prior to Jesus 
but again, Jesus and God, God, including Jesus, would have had the power over the wind. Yeah. Not only to stop it, but to reverse it. And so, and, and Philip and Azotus, you know, I don't know whether that was a miraculous or not, or whether it was simply a, uh, uh, a linguistic phrase, a, a reference to what could have been in elaborated upon in yeah. Acts chapter uh, eight. Okay. It's just as to me, kind of struck a little bit of similarity, depending on how you want to look at it, you know, where it was instantly moved over there or just referencing how quickly they finished the rest of the journey there. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts on that? With God, either one is possible. Exactly. Yeah. And we have already seen the laws of nature manipulated, broken by Jesus himself. So anything like that um, would have been very possible. Yeah. And to me, anything else, if it would had been important, it would have been revealed. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you know, kind of a thought to help yourself interpreting scripture, especially if you're studying with others, trying to teach them is, uh, always assume the natural, unless you, unless it's obviously the supernatural, you know, I mean, that, that, that helps you from a standpoint of studying that's not denying the supernatural or that it could be the supernatural, but, but, but the point is, like you said, the observation here, you know, uh, immediately, it, it, it just happened as quickly as it could happen. All uh, They were struggling before this. They're now not struggling. So I, I think that's an interesting observation when studying with people. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right. Any other thoughts on that before we step into our next section? I just want to touch mm -hmm. on, on what Tom said there. The same rule can be applied to literal versus figurative language. Language should always, in the Bible, should always be interpreted literally unless it is impossible. Then you take the figurative. Whereas some people will jump on the figurative first uh, rather than the, uh, rather than the uh, uh, literal first. And, uh, if, and, and again, I think that is uh, what you might call Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the best. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not explaining away the miraculous. That's not explaining away the figurative. I mean, they literally are there. And, and of course, I make that point. I make that point because when you go to the book of Revelation, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the premillennialist put a whole lot more literal to what is figurative or uh, conveniently throughout the text where they want to. So, Plus here, you've already got the physical miracle. Uh, and so you you feel free then, uh, at least I would, to make this uh, not an instantaneous in the sense of miraculous event, uh, but a natural event of immediately coming to the shore. We've already seen the supernatural event in him walking on the sea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The skeptic tries to explain away the walking on the sea, yeah. which, we're, which we're not doing. Right. That's a good point. All right, let's see. Any other thoughts before we get into this next section? Okay. So as we proceed now in this next section, we're going to find that people, they're going to become looking for Jesus. They find he's not where he was, so they, they seek him. And now we see an interesting um, change within the way Jesus deals with the people. Because first time around, he had compassion on him, on them, and he fed them. But now the next time, the, the next day when they're following him, he's going to be more critical of them because of the reason why they are following him. And so we'll get into that here. Uh, Mr. Tom, would you mind reading for us, starting in verse 22? And let's just read down through, well, it's a little bit longer there in our reading. Let's kind of break this up just before he, let's read down through 25, 22 through 25, if you would, and then we'll continue after that. Okay. All right. Uh, John 6, 22 through 25. 
On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no one or no other boat there, except that one which the disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with the disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread, after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? All right, thank you, Mr. Tom. So there's a couple things here that kind of catches your attention, that makes you, it kind of helps to explain Jesus' response in verse 26, and we'll get to that here in just a moment. Before we talk about this, I want to bring in a quick comment before it gets away from me. Caleb, on the uh, YouTube side of the world, says this miraculous movement of Jesus was recognized by the people, not just the disciples. Although they don't have the detail of him walking on water, they understood there was only um, one about, um, they, they knew Jesus was not with them. So when they get back there to the area, they recognize that Jesus is not there. Now here's a question. Why are they coming back to this area? So we have on the following day with the people who were standing on the other side of the sea, they saw that the apostles, the disciples' boats were not there, um, except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. They seem to be coming to this area. Now you tell me if I'm going too far with this speculation here. He said, however, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. Do you think that that statement kind of points to the reason why they're coming back? In other words, word spread that Jesus fed 5,000 people free food. So the next day, many more people are coming back to the same area, maybe hoping for the same thing. Now, that seems like a very strong speculation because when Jesus talks with them, as we'll read here in a minute, he's going to address this very cause or reason behind why they're seeking him. Do you think that could be why Matthew tells or John tells us this? I, I absolutely think it is the reason. Uh, like you said, you, uh, uh, I, I would say there may be some speculation, but it's not that strong. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is, I think it's pretty much proven. It, 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 it's uh, I, I think it's it's more strong evidence that that's the case because yeah. because uh, 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 what Jesus says to them on this occasion and and here you have oh he oh he fed all of us with five loaves and two fish. Let's go see if he can do it again. I could clearly I could clearly see that happening um, on several occasions. I mean even when you look at what they ask him. You know, when when you get down to verses thirty and thirty one, uh, the very question they ask him, "What what sign are you going to perform?" Which we'll get to, and then they yeah. even appeal to Moses and Manna, and Jesus has to uh, correct them on that. So I I think I, I think I think you're dead on accurate as to that's the reason why this is happening. Okay, I, it, I mean, there's got to be a reason. He tells us many more or other boats came from Tiberias to the place where he fed them. Yeah. I need to correct one thing. So sorry, Caleb, my brain was not functioning right. So the, the, um, you had to talk about AI, artificial intelligence. My eye wasn't working right. Intelligence. It's supposed to be they understood there was only one boat. I don't know why I didn't read that properly or interpret it properly. Um, hey, Paul, Brian, or Bob, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I, th I think you guys are on the, on the money here. Uh, what what he's he's ref I think it's important to remember that he's not emphasizing this is the day after the uh, the miraculous walking on the water, but the day after the feeding of the five thousand right. plus women and children, and uh, and so yes, uh, on the following day they're no longer over there in Tiberias where where the feeding had been, but they don't know that they. They think Jesus is still there. Maybe they've seen uh, uh, the disciples. Well, they did apparently see the disciples getting into a boat, but didn't see Jesus getting into a boat. 
they think Jesus is still over there somewhere in the vicinity of Tiberias. And, uh, but they want if he's not here, where is he? And how did he get there? There's not another boat, uh, or, or there have been other boats, but Jesus has not been in any, any of them. And, uh, so then, uh, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum. So there were other boats there, but uh, as you guys have pointed out, they were empty, but they could take advantage of them. But there was no, uh, all the boats could be accounted for, which would not be the case if Jesus had taken a boat without him having gotten into the boat of the, of the disciples. And so, uh, Somehow they know Jesus has did not get into the boat, and uh, and so they think he's still over there. And uh, there's some of that, but it's not exactly clear as clear in my mind as I would like for it to be. But uh, but then they came back over to the Capernaum side of the sea, mm -hmm. uh, where it is called the Sea of Galilee, and. Uh, when did you come here? And so this is not his immediate disciples. This is other people who I believe have wanted to, to be, a, be fed again. There, it's been another, it's been a day since they had anything they need. They've been excited over these events. And so, uh, we're, we're getting hungry again. Let's find Jesus who he can feed us. Didn't Jesus dwell in Capernaum at least for a period of time? Because that's where Peter was at, if I, if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly. That's right. Uh, Jesus was at Capernaum, but on this occasion, uh, remember in verse uh, uh, 16, when the evening came, uh, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had already been in Capernaum, but they had gone uh, over to Tiberias. Uh, back in chapter 6, verse 1, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And so that would indicate a westward to eastward uh, direction here. He crosses from Galilee over into Tiberias. And, uh, and so it's in Tiberias that this feeding would have taken yeah. place. And so I just now wonder the, if they're going back to their home port in Capernaum. Yeah. You know. That's right. So, uh, and so, but these people, they don't know what's, been, what's going on. Yeah. So I'd say that, I wonder if that's why the people went back to Capernaum. He's not there if they thought, well, let's go back to where their home port. I'm guessing here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, why would they yeah, know to go to Capernaum? Yeah. That's right. Because his disciples, that's where his immediate disciples went. Yep. And so they're assuming that maybe he got there somehow, but they don't know how. Hence the question in 25. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's continue forward. And by the way, if you have any thoughts or comments for us, feel free to drop them in to the, the comment area or the chat area. We would love to hear from you. You can also send us an email. I'll share it again real quick. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. If we don't see it during the course of our study, we'll do our best to bring it into our next study. Uh, Paul, if you would, let's continue reading, picking up there in verse 26. And I think you haven't read yet. So, um, well, again, we've got another long section here. Let's go down to verse um, 20, 29. No, let's stop at 30, another cliffhanger. <laughs> All right. John six twenty six through 30? Yeah. Okay. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. <clears throat> then they said to him, What shall we do? that we may work the works of God. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. 
Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? All right. Thank you, Paul. When we step back there to verse number 26, it's an, it's an interesting response, Paul, that Jesus makes to them. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And then he says, don't labor for the food which perishes. What's his point? Well, uh, it reminds me of a situation we see in the book of Acts also. But uh, here is that they were more interested in uh, having their physical needs met than their spiritual needs. Uh, he says that, that there's something you really need. There's something that you really need to be seeking, but you're seeking the wrong thing. You're seeking this food. Uh, maybe it was the, maybe it, it could have been the impressiveness of the miracle. Uh, it was certainly a great miracle, uh, but it also may have just been the fact that they benefited a great deal from uh, being close to Jesus, and so they wanted that. And so uh, he talks to them about other things. Uh, we didn't go quite as far as verse thirty-one, where it talks about uh, bread from heaven. Uh, mm -hmm. But he talks about what the work of God really was, was that uh, they would believe in him. And it reminded me of, um, wasn't it Peter and John who were uh, going to uh, the temple and they encountered the, the man uh, who was begging and they say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you. And uh, that they uh, are able to heal the man, but in that healing to reveal and to prove their message uh, that they were were out there preaching. And so uh, the man wanted money. Uh, certainly he would have wanted his health, but a greater thing is that he would come to, in that case, hear, believe, understand, and obey the gospel. So, Yeah. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Five and six, yeah. Good point. Good point. Right. You know, you know, John. Uh, we're dealing with circumstances here where we've got larger crowds of people, and the larger the crowd, the more likely uh, there's a materialistic aspect to what they are doing. And in, in other words, the point that I am making here is. I'm sure every time Jesus was teaching, you had a percentage that were interested in his message. You know, is this the Messiah? What does he want us to do? But then you also have another percentage that they want, it's self-serving. Uh, they want a meal. Uh, they want to be healed. They want to be amazed and just watch some type of a miracle. It's not so much about the message as it is the acts that they're watching. And, and bear in mind that this is the next day, so word has spread. You have more and more people that are coming for curious reasons. So Jesus is turning the focus back to the message. And, and, and uh, he's trying to get that understood by these individuals. And, and we see the sadness of the circumstance develop throughout the rest of John 6. I mean, it reaches a point where many leave him because, because it was about the message primarily. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I also want to bring us back to verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. This is why he was on the mountain. They were going to take him and uh, and make him king. They wanted to mold. They wanted a king at uh, a geopolitical king who could feed an army uh, with just a few pieces. I mean, they saw the miracle. They knew it was a miracle, uh, but they were not thinking even in terms. I don't think of their own. Uh, their own particular satisfaction uh, as far as eating is concerned, but what he could do as king. And so uh, that is, is what he's, I think, getting at here in verse uh, uh, 20, 
26, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. But the eating of the loaves was, uh, to me, an indication to them that he could feed an army and would therefore be the perfect uh, uh, the perfect king. And so I think we need to keep that verse 15 uh, in view, especially uh, with regard to the sermon that he is, because after this sermon, they went back and followed him no more because he makes it obvious he did not come to be a geopolitical king. Yeah, and, and, and that ties into the uh, materialist, materialistic point, you know. So th that's a good observation there from that standpoint, Bob. I mean, all, all of it was materialistic. In other words, it was more about what are you going to do for us yeah. rather than yeah. what do we need to do to learn from you. Good point. All right. Well, this is at least the third time we see something similar to this. The woman at the well, you know, he talks about a water that's not the physical water, but a spiritual water of life. Then he talks to his disciples when he says that I have food. My food is to do the will of my heavenly father. Um, and so this is just another one instance showing uh, him using a, the example of something that is physical to highlight the more important spiritual. In this case in point, the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. Because the God, God the Father has set his seal on him. Who is the him referencing here? Because God the Father has set his seal on him. That'd be Jesus, uh, would it? Wouldn't yeah, it? he's speaking of himself, yeah. third person. Yeah. Or, yeah. That's a good point, Tom. Let's not forget this. When he says there, I'll just one more time. Sorry, should have left it up there. When he says, for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. This is one of seven times that Jesus, not one of seven, one of several times that Jesus refers to himself after the fashion of the writings of Daniel in Daniel 7, 14, I believe it is. I may be off on that, where he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Um, God has set his seal upon him. So you listen to him and receive that food, which is for everlasting life. You know, that um, seems to me to be his self-reference of preference. Yes. Mm -hmm. he, he refers to himself as the son of man more often than in any other way. Yeah. Throughout, I think that is throughout the four gospels. I think you're right. Yeah. A couple of comments uh, here. Uh, oh, go ahead, Bob. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that quickly. They saw the signs. Mm -hmm. Just didn't see them as signs. They saw them yeah. as a means of feeding themselves and perhaps an army. Yeah. Not the greater confirmation, hey, the Son of God is with us. Right. It's, Here's a great food source or something. Yeah. Um, Caleb, let's bring in a couple comments here real quick. Caleb says, Jesus knows what's in their hearts, going back to what we're reading there in verse number. 20 verse 26 and 27 and then david clark he says as christians we are to hear the word of god they wanted entertainment and that is still growing today that's not wrong i mean you're right about that david oftentimes people are drawn in by entertainment not the word of god and when you take the entertainment away they leave um it's got to be a draw using the word of god that which he's given us Caleb says, those who truly want to follow Jesus do and seek to understand. How many times does Jesus teach a, uh, sorry, how many times does Jesus teach a parable and no one comes to him and asks what it means, but his disciples come and ask. That's a good point. That's a good point. He often used parables and his disciples wanted to know what they meant. And then Caleb says, these people don't really want to understand as we see when they leave. And that's a very good point we'll be getting to here in just a moment. And uh, Marsha Patterson is watching as well. So I appreciate you joining us for our study today. You know, right, any, the, yeah, go ahead, Bob. John is uh, even among churches of Christ, there are those who use gimmicks. Yeah. And, uh, and church buses, I don't know, church buses may be a thing of the past now, but there were 
running churches around the neighborhood and loading them up with kids and bringing in them to services, but they soon found themselves overrun with unruly, unruly children because their, their parents weren't with them. And the parents are just glad to get them out of the house for a Sunday. Uh, but whatever it takes to get people in, that's what it's going to take to keep them. Yeah, that's right. And if, if you're using the word of God to draw people, that's what it's going to keep, take to keep the people. But uh, here, people were not being drawn because of the word of God. They're being drawn because of the miracles, not because of what the miracles signified, mm -hmm. but because of the miracles themselves. And uh, and that's why when the when the when the miracles stopped. People stopped, that is, in a, in a given location, because that's all they were in there for. They weren't there to seek truth. Uh, they weren't there to understand God's will. Uh, they were there, again, for a king uh, that could deliver them from say, uh, Caesar. Yeah. And by the way, make a quick connection, folks at home. Um, what we were just reading here about his rebuke of them it's why we said what we the speculation about why other boats came from Tiberias to the area where he fed them. The idea is they probably word got out overnight and other people came to be fed. And he does yeah. identify the fact that they were there for that reason to be fed. I know. Okay. Let's see. Oh, real quick, twenty eight. It's an interesting question they ask him. Let me bring it up again real quick. So their question is, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? What do you think about that question? Because I'm still not sure what is, what are they asking him? Because he doesn't appear to talk about a work of God within this text here. What do you think maybe they were asking him? What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Are they talking about do miracles as well or what? I think yeah, it's yeah. kind of like the, the rich young servant who came, you know, what must I do that I may inherit eternal life? Okay. Uh, but he wasn't prepared to do what was really necessary to, to sell all that he had and give to the, give to the, to the needy. And so, uh, he, he doesn't really want to please God. He just wants to, uh, to have a guarantee that he has a place in the kingdom. Sorry, Tom. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. And, and, and I'm basically going in the same direction. You know, Jesus has just pointed out their physical desires. You're here for the miracles and stuff like this. But then he makes the point about spiritual food or, uh, or, or, or things like that, uh, the everlasting life. And, of course, uh, they're, they're interested in, well, okay, what exactly is that? You know, and, and so, so, okay, and so they're asking the question, you know, well, what is it we need to do to do the work of God? They could say that and still be thinking on their materialistic plane. And, and at the same time, there's also in every one of these audiences, I believe there's also those who are genuine, you know, that were along with them. But I think you've got a lot of the idea here of, of they're looking at it, the materialistic, you know, Jesus hasn't, uh, insulted them yet jesus has just made a statement to where oh there's more there's more and of course that's when jesus responds you know there in verse 29 this is the work of god that you believe in him who whom he sent and so he's now now he's going to tie this into something spiritual and he's going to introduce what who he really is again to these individuals and it's only just as a side note to this Remember, this is one of those verses that demonstrates belief involves an action. Because Jesus is saying here, this is the work of God that you believe in me. Yeah. That's a good point. Any other thoughts? I, I just want to say that he's not saying that uh, belief is a work. I think he's saying that this is what God wants to do. He wants to make a believer out of you. Uh, his, that's his work. That's your God point. Is to make people believers. Uh, 
but but you cannot he could not do so against their will he could only give them uh sign, the signs that would help them see that that what they need to do is change their will change their direction in life and become more like jesus more like god than they had been okay paul do you got any thoughts no, I've just been listening uh, closely, and I don't think I have anything uh, better to add just to by hearing it in my own voice. So, uh, but I appreciate uh, the study we've had today and, and the good thoughts. It's been very helpful. Okay. All right. Well, let's plan to uh, stop the study for today. We'll pick up, we've talked about it a little bit, but we'll pick up with verse 29 next week and let us kind of get a, a good running start into what he's about to tell them that God would have them to do. And they're going to say, well, you know, what will you do so that we will believe in you? And so then it will go into a conversation that ends up causing many people to say this teaching is too hard for us and they will leave him. And so we'll, we'll look more at that next week. All righty. Well, listen, I appreciate, and we all, all four of us here today, I guess, four of us, we really appreciate you joining us for our study today. It means a lot to us that you've taken time to um, help us along, to be a part of our study through the Gospel of John. Now, we will plan next Thursday to continue this there with verse 29 of John chapter 6. And uh, if you get time, look at it before we get there next week and just kind of have it all within your mindset, what we're going to be studying and if you have any thoughts or questions, send them to us. Email us at, send it to uh, questions at truthfactorlive.com. Or if you didn't like something Tom said, write them at tom at truthfactor.com or bob at truthfactor.com. Or Paul, if you like his hair today, you could write him to paul at truthfactor.com. You get the point. All righty, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you next week at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. Right back here at Truth Factor or Truth Factor Live on our social media platforms. Y'all have a very wonderful week. Bye-bye.